take your scriptures and turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. This summer we've been looking through the first letter of John. Um, and um, it's been interesting for us. So this morning we want to continue with that. 1 John chapter 2. We'll begin reading with verse 18. You follow along on your copy of God's Word. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belonged to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And all of you have knowledge. I write you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and so you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it taught you, abide in him. And now little children abide in him so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. This is the word of God. So we're going to begin with a hard start this morning. There's no introduction. Here's point number one. Everybody with me? I have some questions. There are three questions that I want to ask and hopefully clarify. Question number one is, when when is the last hour? You heard that at the very beginning of the reading? We are in the last hour. Now you've heard of that a lot. If you watch radio, TV preachers and listen to, or watch, well, that'd be hard to do watching radio TV preachers. If you listen to radio preachers and watch TV preachers, there's all kinds of understandings about the second coming of Christ. And, um, and you'll hear this term, the last hour, the last hour. So what is John talking about here? Here we are 2,000 years later and we are still here. Did John miscalculate when the last hour was to occur? How many of you watch football? So we can be friends, those of you who watch football. All right. When your wife or your husband says dinner will be ready, and let me just use myself as an example. Lynette says lunch is served, and I'll say to her, uh, she'll say, how much time is left in the game? And I'll say, it's at the two-minute warning. Now, when I say there's a two-minute warning, does that mean there's only 120 seconds left? What does that usually mean? Okay, you know this story, right? So the two-minute warning does not mean 120 seconds are left and then we can go eat. It means it could be going on for a long, long time. John is basically saying the two-minute warning has sounded. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that in in 60 minutes Jesus will return when he says the last hour is here. That's not what he's talking about. He means that the life 
and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost have ushered in a new phase of human history. The triumph of God is assured and there still will be opposition. His point in bringing this up is not to get people to guess of when Jesus will return or to try to calculate when exactly is the last hour up. That's not his point. He's not encouraging Christians to predict the second coming of Christ and to look at the geography and to look at the geopolitical situation and watch the news and Israel and Russia and China and how it's all aligning. He's not saying do that. What he's saying is simply this. Don't quit so close to the finish line. The conflict between this world and the kingdom of God is in its final stages. The defeat of the enemy is upon us. That's the last hour. We're in it. A second question is, who are these antichrists? Did you see that read here? It's found in verse 18. Who are these antichrists? Now, the radio teachers and the TV preachers will tell you who it is. But I, I don't think that's very fair because the only time the term antichrist is ever mentioned in God's word is in 1 John and 2 John. Did you know that? It's thrown around a lot, but the only time it's mentioned is in 1 John and 2 John. And there's a couple of things about this. Notice there are plural antichrists. Did you see that? There's more than one. And notice a second observation about that. They are currently alive when John was writing this letter. They are here right now. Hmm. Now, there are other places in the New Testament where a figure of ultimate opposition to Christ and his kingdom are talked about. You can find that in 2 Thessalonians. You can find that in the book of Revelation. And there are different understandings among Christians about whether these references are primarily about one figure at the end of time or a spirit of opposition against Jesus. And good Christians can disagree about this. There are different understandings. 1 John 4, 3 in your Bible there says this, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the what? Antichrist. Of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. But here in this context, John is using this term to describe false teachers who had infiltrated the churches and who were dragging people away from faith in Christ. They were trying to mislead the church and they denied the centrality of Jesus. Denial that Jesus is who he said he was and that he came in the flesh as the son of God. Look in verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belong to us. Eventually, when they couldn't get their way, these false teachers left the church. And when they did, they broke community. And if there's one thing you know, if you've been at our church for very long, that the Bible teaches over and over again how valuable community is. Sense of family, sense of community. This is what makes us so unique in the world. Now in our day, we are used to church fights. How many of you ever noticed that, that churches like to fight? Oh, you haven't. Well, you, clearly you're not Baptist. Because <laughs> Baptists, there's an old cigarette commercial. Do you remember that? They'd rather fight than what? Switch. Some of you still smoke, I guess. I don't know. But remember the, no. Do you remember the black eye? They had a commercial all about that. We'd rather fight than switch. That's, a, that's Baptist for crying out loud. And so people become dissatisfied with their church and then they move on to another church just down the street or across town. They leave because the preaching is better over there. And one of the worst things you can ever say to a pastor is, I'm just not being fed anymore. 
And you know, when a pastor hears that, you know what he thinks? You're a child. Because when your children come to you and say, I don't like what's for supper, what did you say to them? Well, eat it. <laughs> but we, in my family, we call that going hungry. If you didn't want to eat what was being served, you just went hungry. Or they leave the church because the chairs are more comfortable over there, or the music's different or better, or the church is more organized, or it's larger, or it's smaller. And we've come to be desensitized by the transience of church members from church to church to church. John is really concerned about that kind of fluidity. It's a fragmentation of community. I wonder if John might still have Jesus' words ringing in his ears when Jesus said this right before he died on the cross. That they all may be one, Father. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. In other words, Jesus is praying to his father. May the people who call me Lord stay united because that's the way that the unchurched world will recognize that Jesus is the son of God. Now, let me ask you something. Would you say that the church of Jesus Christ in our country is united this way? It is not. That's to our great shame. To John, destroying the unity of the body is unthinkable. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. And when churches and, and denominations and Christians start fighting about different things in theology and different things in the culture wars and different things in politics, when they start going at each other that way publicly, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. That's fragmenting the body of Christ and destroying the witness of the church of Jesus Christ in our culture. So the point of this passage is not to spend a lot of time trying to figure out who the Antichrists are. The point is to abide in the real Christ and to be devoted to the body of Christ. Who is this anointing? Or what is this anointing in verse 27? Another question. Now in the Old Testament, anointing was reserved for a very few special people. You know, in kings and prophets and priests, they were anointed. Anointing was especially associated with the Spirit of God coming to rest upon someone. In 1 Samuel 16, we read about young shepherd boy David, these words. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. It was reserved for special people. It was not for the ordinary citizen. But that changed. When Jesus came, lived his life, died the death that should have been my death and your death, went into the grave and came out of the grave on the third day in the resurrection, and then when Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell on the church, the Holy Spirit then begins to indwell believers in Christ. And now we all have this anointing. We are all filled with this Spirit. Every person since that day has placed their faith in Jesus, has been anointed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 27 says, as for you, the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And so you do not need anyone to teach you. Now, does this mean that the role of a teaching pastor in the church is not necessary? Let me say that again. Does this mean, I'm getting a little insecure here, that the role of a teaching pastor in the church is not necessary? Answer? 
No, it is listed as one of the gifts of the Spirit and one of the offices of the church. That's not what John is saying. What he's saying is don't be intimidated or misled by someone who claims to be superior to you because they've had some sort of special revelation or special understanding of the Word of God. The same Spirit that lives in me that helps me write sermons lives in you to help you interpret these sermons and to interpret the scripture yourself. You do not need a teacher to hear from God through his word. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That's what he's saying. That's why you bring your Bible to church. That's why you look at the context of the verses that the preacher preaches about. That's why when you turn the TV on and you watch your favorite TV preacher, you better have your Bible open on your lap and you better see that he's not misrepresenting the word of God. You have the same spirit living inside of you to interpret the text. All right, questions aside. Faith grows as we abide. In the time that I have left, which is not much, I want to talk about abiding in God. At the end of the reading I gave you a moment ago, you heard that word abiding over and over and over again. Did you not? So what is that talking about? Abiding in God when it's easy. Abiding in God when it isn't easy. How do you stay? How do you remain connected to God? An elderly couple lies in bed and she's not satisfied with the distance between them in bed. And she reminds him when they were young, she says, you used to hold my hand in bed. He hesitates, but in a few moments, a wrinkled hand snakes over across the bed and grabs hers. She's not satisfied. When we were young, you used to cuddle right up next to me. A longer hesitation this time but eventually with a few groans he laboriously turns his body and cradles hers as best he can she's not satisfied when you were young and I was young you used to nibble on my ear <sighs> loud sigh throws back the covers gets out of bed she says where are you going I'm gonna go get my teeth <laughs> I've been waiting for four years to tell that story this, at this particular church. Listen, it's one thing to nibble on an ear when you're young and in love and the air is filled with the scent of ew, dear something or another, or nibbling when nibbling is easy. It's another thing to nibble when the ear doesn't hear so well anymore and contains a hearing device and the air is filled with the scent of Bengay and you have to get up and get your teeth first. <laughs> it's one thing to abide in God when the bills are paid and the job is secure and your health is good. It's another thing to abide in God when you have to stand in line at the food bank. It's another thing to abide in God when you've just lost your job. It's another thing to abide in God when the doctor said the tumor is malignant. It's hard to abide in God like that. But he says in chapter 2, verse 28, and now little children, abide in him. Abide when it's difficult. Abide when you are confused. Abide when you are disappointed in God. Abide when you are disillusioned. Abide. You know, when you and I first became Christians and we began to pursue spiritual things, Man, things were so exciting. Do you remember those days? You couldn't wait to open up the Word of God and read it. You couldn't wait to come to church and hear more about it. You couldn't wait to sing songs and your heart was filled with joy and expectation and anticipation. You were just hungry for the Word of God and for God Himself. And you just sometimes could almost hear God speak directly to you. 
Maybe that was your experience. It certainly has been the case for many. But there comes a time in our lives when something happens. And we wake up one morning and things are different. Or it might be just a gradual deadening. But it's a very real thing. What once was easy, open up God's word, read it, feeds your soul, now becomes very difficult to do. It's effortful. Talking to God seems like you're talking to a brick wall. It's draining to you. And you find yourself not wanting to pray anymore or stopping and not praying anymore. And the Bible feels dull. Church is boring. You're troubled by doubts. Doubts about God, doubts about yourself, doubts about your salvation. Confusion starts to reign. Temptations that you once thought you had ultimate victory over are now rearing their head again. And you thought, I should be past this. And yet you're not. You go to worship and you see other people taking notes and seeming to get something out of the sermons or close their eyes and experience the depth of joy that comes in worship. Come to the table and feel the depth of love there for the Lord. You see other people do that and you think, why isn't that happening for me anymore? Anybody here ever been through some place like that? Let me see your hands. Are you brave enough to tell me? Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. You know what I call that? I call that spiritual dryness. And I've been through that. And there are some possible causes. Sometimes the reason I feel disconnected from the things of God and the word of God and the people of God is because I have unconfessed, unrepentant sin in my life. Are you with me here? If I knowingly commit a sin and I hide it and I cover it up and I keep practicing it, there is a disconnect spiritually and that may be the reason why I am dead and I don't feel alive and I feel this dryness. Sometimes that's the case. And the solution is quite simple. We studied about that in chapter 1, verse 9. If we, if we sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when I repent of that sin and start walking in a new direction, and sometimes that brings that spirit of life back. So sometimes it's sin. But sometimes the dryness is not because you've sinned. Sometimes the dryness is just because you're living a life and sometimes that life feels barren. And there is no cause or effect. You cannot figure out what it possibly could be. Sometimes if I'm experiencing spiritual dryness, this felt absence of God's presence, I assume I'm doing something wrong. Job and Job's friends assumed he had done something wrong for all this calamity to come upon him. But we know that story and it wasn't anything Job did. Sometimes I feel like I've done something wrong. I'm not studying the word right. I, I need to, a change. I, I'm not reading enough. I don't have enough faith. I'm, not, I'm making wrong choices. And God is withdrawing his presence from me. It's punishment. No, not necessarily so. The writer Thomas Merton helps us with this. He says this. God, who is everywhere, never leaves us. Yet sometimes he seems to be present and sometimes absent. And if we do not know him well, we do not realize that he may be more present to us when he's absent than when he's present, when it feels like he's close. The way you know you've met the real God of the universe is that you hunger and thirst for him. Hunger is never a wonderful feeling. If you've ever really been hungry, it doesn't feel good. 
When you've really been thirsty, you don't relish that, oh, I just love this thirst. No, you ache to have it what? Quenched. You ache for water to be present, for food to be present. And that's where some of us are in our journey with Jesus. We ache for Jesus. We ache for God. And that ache tells us that he is close. So can you abide during those times? Can you remain? Can you stay connected to the vine when you don't see fruit? How many of you remember teaching your children to ride a bike? Anybody? All right. My dad's not here today, so I'm going to tell this story about him. My dad helped me learn to ride a bike. I remember living in Zephyr, Texas, and dad thought it was time to take the training wheels off the bike. I did not agree with my father that this was a good idea. He said, you're five years old. <laughs> it's time. You ride a bike without training wheels. I was not convinced, but he took them off. He, and I said, now what am I going to do? And, and he said, I'll help you. And I, I, I love my dad, but I questioned him at that point. He stood the bike up, put me on. My feet could barely hit the little pedals. And then he held the back of that bike. And this is exactly what he said. Now to stay upright, son, what you have to do is you have to pick a, a point out in a distance, a target. And you've got to keep your eyes on that. If you look down at the ground, if you look at the pedals, you will get disoriented and you will fall over. So pick out a spot that you want to go towards and focus on it and then start pedaling and head for that target. Okay. So here I am tottering and he's got the hand on the back of the little bike seat. And he said, are you ready? And he said, by the way, don't stop pedaling. Okay, so here I go. He let, kind of gave me a little shove, which was unkind. But he gave me a little shove to break the inertia, and then I started pedaling. And I'm going straight at the target. The target I chose was a light pole across the parking lot of our driveway. And I pedal, 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 faster, faster, faster. Bang, right into the light pole. My dad came running up to me and said, why didn't you steer? away from the light pole. And I remember saying, you didn't say anything about steering. <laughs> but I do remember that as long as my dad's hand was on the back of that bike seat, I felt safe and secure. The minute he let go, I didn't feel so secure. But if he had never let go, I would have never learned how to ride the bike without training wheels. Are you following me here? Did my dad abandon me? No. In fact, later on he told me he was running right behind me, hands out. He just couldn't get fast enough in front of me to keep me from hitting the telephone pole. I would have never learned to ride the bike without training wheels had he never let go. He had never abandoned me. He was there all the time. But when you ride on your own, unsupported, it sometimes feels like you are not going to make it. But the fact is you're growing. You just don't realize it. Maybe that's kind of where you are. You're at a place where you don't feel the close hand of your father. You may not have felt that close hand for some time. And you're tempted to give up. But the truth is, you've got a chance now, right now, to learn how to ride. So a couple of lessons that I've gleaned from this during dry times. Lessons to learn during dry times with the Father. Number one, you can learn the discipline of perseverance. It is one of the spiritual disciplines. The, spirit of dis the, the, the spiritual lesson of persevering during dry times. In other words, don't 
give up. The word abide, you know what it means? It means remain. It means stay put. It means stay put even when it feels dry. It means stay put when you're confused. It means stay put when you feel useless. When you don't understand. When you've lost a little hope. Stay put. Abide. If you're in a season of spiritual dryness, don't quit. Don't quit Jesus. Don't quit the church. Don't quit. Now, some of you may be really tempted to do that. There could be, for some of us here today, a relationship that's, that's wrong. And you're tempting to give up on God's word. Don't give up on God's word that tells you that that relationship is wrong. It could be that a marriage has grown stale or boring or even hostile. And you're tempted to walk away. It could be a difficult person in your world. It could be a child that's difficult, a parent that's difficult, a coworker, a church member. You're tempted to write them off. It could be that you're tempted to give up on prayer or maybe give up on prayer for that person because they may never come to Christ and that's how you've been praying for them for 30 years and they're still no closer to Christ as far as you can tell and you're tempted to stop. Or maybe you have a besetting sin and you've repented of it so many times that you can't even count. And you fail and you fail and you fail and you fail. And you're tempted to just quit trying to repent. It's so ingrained in who you are. Listen, abiding starts by just not giving up. There is a fierce stubbornness to abiding in Christ. So lesson number one, you learn the spirit, the discipline of perseverance. Lesson number two is you can learn the depth of God's love sometimes in no other way. The depth of his love. When you are on top of your spiritual game, when you are praying with relentless joy and you are untroubled by temptation and you triumph in ministry and everything you seem to touch turns to spiritual gold and you're serving well and the success in your ministry and what you do for the church and what you do in the committee and what you do for your children just seems to be coming up roses it's easy for you to believe during those times of spiritual fruit and spiritual uh, of depth that the reason God loves you so much is because everything you touch turns to gold. It's easy for you to sometimes think the reason I am being favored by God is because I'm doing everything so right. But when you continue to come to God, even when you don't pray very well, but you continue to come. When you continue to come to God, even when you don't even talk to him, you just go stand there. When you continue to come to God and you sing the songs, even when they don't feel good to you. When you continue to go to God, when everything is falling out in your life. When you continue to go to God, when you are a sinner and the stench of your sin is still on you. When you continue to go to God during those times, that's when you're going to realize that at the core of who you are, you cannot sin away the love of God. And it's there at the depth of your sin and nastiness that you experience him. And you realize down deep in your soul that he loves you not because you've been a good boy or a good girl. He loves you because he chooses to love you. So like Peter, Peter's my patron saint. Peter says some really good things, and then he says some of the stupidest things. 
Peter is ready. He's ready to charge hell with a squirt gun for Jesus. Take his sword out and cut off somebody's ear. He's ready. And then a little girl says, aren't you one of his disciples? And he curses and runs away. This is Joe. This is Peter. This is perhaps you. Peter has denied Jesus. Cursed the day. And he's out fishing. So that's all he knows to do. Now that the dream has been destroyed of the kingdom being ushered in to Israel, gone because Jesus is gone, Peter goes fishing. And then there's a miracle catch. And then John says, I think that stranger on the shore is the Lord. And Peter jumps out of the boat and starts run, swimming towards Jesus. And there on the Sea of Galilee, over a charcoal fire, with fish grilled and bread and biscuits being baked, Jesus and Peter have a moment. And right then and right there, when Peter was at his worst, Jesus says, I'm not done with you. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, have a biscuit, have some fish. That is when Peter knew that in spite of all he'd done, Jesus loved him. That's when he knew at his core what it means to be loved by God. Because you know then it's not based on your performance. It's based on God. So ladies and gentlemen, when it gets especially difficult for you, pick out a target way off in the distance. Get your eyes fixed and keep pedaling. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There is a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Or us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are. So what are we going to do? We turn our eyes upon Jesus. We look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth And so, Mountain Heights Baptist Church, God wants to say to you right now, this morning, in that pew, you are the beloved of God. Pick out a target out in the distance and keep peddling. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace, your mercy. May the truth of your word go deep into our souls. May you give us courage to keep peddling, even when it seems like it's too dark. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.